um, important and there's a lot of information to deal with and we don't really have a lot of time to do that in. So um, I want to concentrate today um, on some of the cellular level aspects of what's going on with muscles, um, especially uh, how they function, how they generate contraction. Um, and then next week we're going to continue with the muscles um, and we're going to concentrate more on how muscles do their work as an entire organ. Um, so uh, uh, that's what we'll get to. And actually, what I want I want to do all of that in the first half of this week and the first half of next week. And the second half of this week and the second half of next week, um, I want to deal more with the um, uh, lab material, which is getting to know uh, the particular muscles in our bodies. Uh, and I'll explain that in the second half today. Um, but going into the chapter here, okay, well, before I get into the chapter, uh, let me point out in this unit, so this is a support movement unit from the textbook, uh, which started with this skin and had all this skeleton stuff. And then the joints, which I just told you we're going to um, <coughs> skip over that uh, since I had to cl cancel class last Monday. Um, you can look at the captured recording from last Wednesday's class um, and get that material there. Um, and so then we're up to the muscle tissue chapter. Um, now, it's not just muscle tissue. Um, it's muscles in general. Um, the idea here is kind of like when we did the um, skeleton, we have one chapter here that was about bones and then a couple of chapters about the bones in place in the skeleton. Here we have a chapter about muscle and then a single chapter instead of two about the anatomy of the, the system. Um, so what we do in the second half today and next week will be more about this chapter about the specific anatomy. Um, and what we're doing in the first half today and next week is going to be more about uh, the muscle tissue chapter. So in this chapter, um, it starts off with an overview of muscle tissues because there are three types of muscle tissue. And I want to talk about that briefly. Um, and then it gets into one of those types of tissue, which is skeletal, um, and uh, about how uh, muscles contract, how it's controlled by the nervous system and the different types of fibers that we have making up the muscles in our body. Um, and then uh, a section on um, exercise and performance. And then it goes into the other types of muscle tissue, which is cardiac and smooth muscle. Um, we're not going to look at that specifically in uh, this semester. When we get to the cardiovascular system in ANP2, we'll talk about uh, the specifics of, car of cardiac muscle tissue in more depth beyond the basic explanation I'm about to give you. And then um, we don't ever actually spend time specifically on smooth muscle, um, but it's part of uh, a lot of the organ systems we're going to do in a p 2 so we'll come around to that there too. Um, and then it ends with a developmental regeneration uh, section, which I'm not going to go into. Um, now, I'm not going to go into these uh, different things this semester, but I still expect that you're going to go through this stuff. Um, the uh, assignments that you have will have questions addressing some of those. For the uh, part three and part four assignments, I'm not going to get into cardiac muscle, smooth muscle development, those kind of things. Um, but part one and two multiple choice questions might address those um, uh, to some degree. So I expect you to pay attention to those. Now, as far as the overview of muscle tissue types is concerned in the book, um, really all they have is sort of these three pictures here. Um, and then it describes some aspects can, uh, about muscle tissue that's general to all of the different types. Um, I want to say a few things about the different types of tissue um, using this picture, but I also want to point out, oh, whoops, um, in this week's folder, the muscle tissue folder, um, I have a link right here um, that just says muscle tissue, 
And this goes to a folder that contains um, micrographs of muscle tissue taken with this scope up here, uh, sort of the same way that we had the, the folder of um, tissues that you you guys captured and I uh, put online. Um, I'm not going to have you go through and looking at these different types of muscle tissue because there's not a whole lot of them. Um, but I captured these tissues, so they're examples here, which is nice because in the book they just have this one uh, figure here. Now, <clears throat> this isn't the only thing the book has. The book goes into more detail in the sections on cardiac and smooth muscle. Um, but this is just a, a basic introduction to it. Now, as we're um, considering the types of muscle tissue, um, we classify it as we see it under the microscope based on two things. One is nucleation, and the other is um, uh, what are called striations. Um, so these two um, characteristics, between the two of them make each type of um, muscle tissue unique. And by nucleation, I mean the number of nuclei in a cell. Now, what would you expect the number of nuclei to be in any given cell? One. Yeah. It's almost a law that every cell should only have one nucleus. Um, now, I say almost a law because there are some exceptions to that, but the exceptions to that actually don't entirely break the law um, because... When we have a, nucle a cell with multiple nuclei, what we're actually looking at is more like a supercell. Um, it's a bunch of cells that all merge together, and we see the distinct nuclei left over from them, but uh, all of that's contained within a single cell membrane. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so there are some exceptions to the uh, one nucleus per cell rule that we're used to. And for muscle tissue, um, Skeletal muscle is multinucleated, and cardiac and smooth muscle is mononucleated, meaning that they each only have uh, one nucleus apiece. Now, as we look at the tissues here, oh, um, we can see that there are multiple nuclei in these fibers here. Let me turn the light off. So you can see. Um, and I actually kind of like this picture from the book because it makes a pretty good uh, indication. So each of these bands that we see going across the screen is a single muscle cell, muscle fiber. Um, and what I really like about this is that it's pretty obvious, say in this fiber right here, we can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, maybe an eleventh nucleus. Those are all definitely part of this fiber right here. Um, now again, nuclei, because they contain DNA, are going to stain very darkly. So they stand out very nicely. Um, <clears throat> this is smooth muscle and this is cardiac muscle. And you can't exactly see the specific outlines of each cell in these, but uh, if we think about there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen uh, cells represented here, fibers represented here. Um, and we see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and maybe some fragments of a 14th nucleus. The numbers there work out, okay? It's not ex actually a nucleus in each of these fibers, but we see 14 things going across the screen here and 14 nuclei. So just based on this little sample of the tissue, we see one nucleus for each fiber here. Now, that oversimplifies what we're actually looking at, but it does give you a good point 
uh, of reference compared to this, where we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten um, fibers going across here. And I'm not going to go through because I've already done the counting. There's 41 nuclei in the, in the picture here. Okay, so. Uh, the ratio of 10 fibers to 41 nuclei versus the ratio of 14 fibers to 14 nuclei, I think makes the point pretty clear there. Okay, just it's not a perfect one-to-one -one correspondence of cells and their nuclei, but the nuclei don't outnumber the fibers that we see on the screen right there. Okay. Um, so. <clears throat> While you can't see the exact outline of a particular cell here all the time, um, you don't see a bunch of nuclei in this tissue like you do here. Now, as I'm doing this, I keep kind of zooming past the smooth muscle tissue here um, because it's harder to see a whole lot of it. Um, it's true that the ratio of nuclei to fibers here is, is more in the terms of one to one than say four to one in this picture of the um, skeletal muscle. But uh, we don't really need to get too bogged down with a smooth muscle because we're going to pay more attention to skeletal and um, cardiac. And part of the reason for that comes down to the striations. This basically means that they have a stripy appearance. Okay? Striations are bands of staining. And, oops, skeletal muscle is striated cardiac muscle is striated and smooth muscle is not striated. So um, smooth muscle kind of stands out from the other be others because it's not striated, and we can kind of push it off to the side. And we're more concerned with comparing the two striated muscle types, and that is where the multi versus mononucleated uh, becomes an issue. So in talking about these tissues, I keep zooming past the smooth muscle because we don't really care about it too much. Now, striation. They are alternating dark and light bands that we see in the tissue. And as I zoom in on this, uh, you can see black and uh, light or dark and light uh, bands going back and forth. That's what striations mean. Okay. Now, any staining um, artifact that we see in tissue is necessarily an indication of how it responds to the stain. Okay, so nuclei are very dark. That's a staining artifact because the DNA reacts with the stain very strongly. Um, and these bands that are a little darker represent stripes within the cells that react with the stain more than others. And for this, it's it's a matter of protein. Um, the darkest staining things we see are uh, nucleotides, uh, nucleic acids, like DNA in the nucleus, uh, or RNA in ribosomes or something like that. But for muscle cells, it's almost pure protein in there. It's not, but there's a lot of protein inside the cells. And so that's what's picking up the um, stain. And the pattern of staining light versus dark stripes goes right to what, we, what we'll what we see within the cell there. Okay. Um, let me go back out here. Um, now, having just shown you the skeletal muscle, looking at the smooth muscle next to it, there's definitely not stripes on these uh, fibers. Now, the fibers here are running kind of vertical in the picture. And so we would expect striations, if they existed, to run across horizontal in the picture. See the, the muscle fibers in the skeletal muscle, they're, they're basically horizontal in the picture, so the striations are running fairly vertical. We don't necessarily see that in, uh, we don't see stripes across the fibers in the smooth muscle. But really, if you go to the skeletal muscle, you don't really see the stripes there either. 
And partly that's because of this particular picture. This is a bit out of focus. Um, if I were choosing images to uh, present in a textbook, um, I would have probably picked a better focused picture than this, but for whatever reason they didn't. Um, and without the focus, you can't see the striations that clearly. There are some in here, uh, knowing what to look for, I can pick them out, but they're still kind of um, hard to see. Over here, there's a little bit of a suggestion of dark light alteration bands, sorry, dark and light altering bands going across there. That's about the only place in this tissue I can really see. And so let me go to this tissue here, um, and hopefully I captured a good picture with striations. Um, well, it's better than that one, but uh, say down here, and I can't really zoom in on these any more than that. Um, in this tissue down here, we have some little uh, striations going across the tissue here. There's a little bit of a hint of it up here. Um, and the other place, I can see a little bit down here. If I zoom in on it, it gets covered up by this box of tools. Um, so I can't really show it to you any better than in this uh, basics um, stain here. But uh, there is some evidence in it, this tissue. Um, this is cardiac muscle cut and cross section, so that's not a good place to see that. Um, that's smooth muscle where it's very obviously not striated. Um, and that's um, <clears throat> skeletal muscle cut and cross section. And that's a higher power of that same picture. Here's skeletal muscle and um, longitudinal section. And this one just happened to have a very dark region right here where you can see striations pretty clearly. There's a hint of it at the edge of the tissue here. But a lot of this tissue, the staining is kind of faded. Um, so, well, you can kind of see some striations in here. But this is the most obvious place. Um, this is smooth muscle and cross section. So um, you can look at these tissues for a few other examples, but uh, um, they're not necessarily much better than this. You know, there's a hint of striations right here in this picture. Um, and if you're looking at it on a monitor directly, you'll be able to see a little bit better than up on the screen here. But it's uh, there's definitely a hint of it there. and you might not see it, but I know what I'm looking for, so trust me, it's there. You want to go back in there and just convince yourself that you see little stripes going across right here. Uh, you should be able to pick up on it. Okay. Um, now, in talking about the uh, way that skeletal muscle works, um, oh, that's right. Um, <clears throat> We're going to go on and talk about skeletal muscle um, and how it works a little bit next. And from that, we'll kind of understand where the striations come from. And what I talk about for skeletal muscle applies to, to cardiac muscle, too. It has to do with the way that it produces force, how it contracts. So we'll deal with that. We'll see that in the skeletal muscle and just understand that it translates to how cardiac muscle works to some degree, too. And the specifics of cardi cardiac tissue, again, I said I address when we get to the heart chapter in AMP2, although the book does deal with it a little bit right here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I want to um, <clears throat> move through some of the information about muscles, uh, skeletal muscle tissue kind of quickly to get to what I think is the most important thing about it. Now this picture here, um, Looks like three pictures that are very similar. We have a bundle of kind of reddish colored things with one of the pieces of the bundle sticking out. And then a bundle of kind of reddish colored things with one of the things sticking out. And a bundle of kind of reddish colored things with one of them sticking out. It's kind of a repeating pattern here. And really what we're looking at is um, the muscle, not just muscle tissue, but the muscle and all of the tissues that make it up. Um, having this kind of repeating pattern of organization from 
the whole muscle level down to the cell and subcellular level uh, of organization there. Um, part of what really defines muscles are uh, the connective tissues that are in them aside from the skeletal muscle tissue there. How they're organized is well defined based on connective tissues that are associated with it. So these three pictures here, the big piece is the muscle and then the little pieces inside of it in the top part are called fascicles or which means bundle of fibers. And then here we have a single fascicle represented with the bundle of fibers, individual muscle cells um, represented, one of them pulled out. And then we're looking at one muscle cell and the thing coming out from that. Now wrapped around each of the bigger parts here, so the whole muscle, a fascicle of muscle fibers, or a single muscle fiber, is a layer of connective tissue. And that helps us really define um, muscle tissue quite a bit. Uh, not muscle tissue, muscle as an organ. The whole muscle is wrapped by what we call epimysium. And then fascicles are wrapped by what we call paramysium. And uh, individual muscle fibers are wrapped by endomycium. So these three terms here, epimycium, paramycium, and endomycium, obviously all have as a root MYS, which is the root that means muscle. So epimycium is what's on top of the muscle, surrounding the outside of the whole muscle. Perimycium is what's around the muscle. And in this sense, for us, it's what's around the fascicles and sort of working in between the fascicles uh, of the whole muscle. And then endomycium is what's inside the muscle, and it's wrapped around in individual muscle fibers. Epimycium is dense irregular connective tissue. Paramycium is dense irregular connective tissue. And endomycium is areolar connective tissue. Um, <clears throat> Now, if we go back to the picture here of the whole muscle, um, at the end of the muscle, we see the white uh, extending away from it, which is the tendon. The tendon is made up of dense regular connective tissue. Now, the difference between regular and irregular connective tissue is simply how the collagen's organized. In dense regular connective tissue, all of the co collagen is in parallel. And in dense irregular, the collagen goes in all sorts of different directions. The difference between the epimycium or the paramycium that's in, in the middle here versus the tendon, which is at the end of the organ, just how organized the collagen is. It's actually continuous tissue. The epimycium and the paramycium extend past the muscle tissue and make up the tendon. Once it gets to the tendon, it's dense regular connective tissue, but it's really dense connective tissue that's basically just a bunch of collagen. And then the tendon goes on to extend and attach to the bone where it blends into the periosteum, the dense irregular connective tissue surrounding the bone. And it helps to anchor the um, muscle to the bone so it can cause movement. The areolar connective tissue that surrounds an individual muscle fiber, which for this picture is actually highlighted here rather than the bottom frame, um, it's just loose connective tissue where blood vessels and nerves and those sorts of things can get in close to the cell. They've drawn in this kind of purple, these purple lines here, which are probably supposed to represent blood vessels that are getting um, in next to the fiber, which is going to then deliver oxygen and nutrients to the fibers and carry waste products like CO2 away from it. Um, also, there's a connection between the nervous system and muscle fibers. Um, so it's not in this picture, but there should be a little yellow line representing a nerve that's attaching to the muscle fiber, and that nerve is in the endomycium. The picture of the muscle fiber down below, uh, they don't show the endomycium around it. Instead, what looks like it's been peeled away here, they're actually cutting into the uh, cell membrane to represent the um, the outer covering of the cell itself. 
which is what's labeled here in the picture. Uh, now this is the same thing again um, of the muscle fiber, but there's a little bit more detail and a little bit more um, labeling going on. And so I want to talk about the structure of uh, muscle fiber cells a little bit more here. Um, so what's kind of peeled away here again is the cell membrane. And if we follow it along, we can see it's labeled right here, and it's called the sarcolemma. Now, sarcolemma is a weird kind of old-fashioned name that hasn't gone out of style. Um, we'll see there's a number of things in muscle cells and muscle tissue that have the root sarco in them. Now, sarco kind of generally means flesh, and uh, in the sense of like when you're eating uh, a chicken drumstick or something like that, the flesh that you're eating is the muscle of the chicken. Okay. Um, so sarcolemma specifically means cell membrane of the um, muscle cell because it's a variation of an old-fashioned name for the cell membrane, which is plasma lemma. Now, you've probably heard reference to the plasma membrane, um, I prefer to just use cell membrane, but plasma membrane is used um, in a number of sources currently. Plasma lemma is really outdated. Nobody uses it anymore, but it just means cell membrane. Um, so sarcolemma just has exchanged the general root for the word plasma for the specific root that refers to muscles. Okay. But this is really just the cell membrane of a muscle cell. Next to sarcolemma, of course, they're pointing to a mitochondria, and, and mitochondria uh, aren't don't have a special name in muscle cells. They're just mitochondria. Uh, what do mitochondria do? Okay, I just want to share a little um, pet peeve with for most biology teachers. When somebody asks you what does a mitochondria do, don't say it's the powerhouse of the cell. That's just the most trite description of it. Not that I'm picking on you, but it's... It's sort of this running joke with biology teachers that, that everybody says that because every textbook says that and it's just so trite. What does it mean that it's the powerhouse of the cell? Yeah, it makes energy. Now, the word powerhouse in general English usage is not uh, <clears throat> entirely clear. You can say that somebody is a powerhouse because you know they're the powerhouse for the Yankees, because they're the best player on the team or something like that. Not that I'm a Yankees fan, but uh, just as an example. But powerhouse refers to a physical building where power was converted from, say, uh, water running across a dam into electricity or something like that. That's where powerhouse comes from. And so mitochondria do the same thing. They convert chemical energy in the form of, well, that's derived from nutrient molecules like glucose into the common power, I mean, cow, the, the common energy currency for cells, which is ATP. Okay. Now, ATP is very uh, important for the function of muscles, so they have a lot, a lot of mitochondria to make all the ATP they need. Um, they're also pointing out a nucleus here, and we can see three nuclei sort of at the edge of the cell here, and we saw in the micrograph a lot of nuclei along the edge of the cells. The nuclei are usually at the outside edge because there's no room for them deeper inside the cell. Most of the cell is filled with what are represented by these little yellow lines, uh, circles here, and there's one um, shown down below in a bit more detail. It's labeled right here. It's called a myofibril, which basically means muscle fiber, but the IL ending makes it mean a small muscle fiber. So within the muscle fiber that's the cell, it's filled with a bunch of fibers that are responsible for contraction. Um, it's not evident in the picture of the whole cell here, but it is suggested down below. The myofibrils have wrapped around this, wrapped around them, this kind of lacy structure, which is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. What does that sound like to you? Yeah, endoplasmic reticulum. So kind of like sarcolemma is the, the muscle cell version of plasma lemma that's no longer used, but 
That's why they're using sarco here. Sarcoplasmic reticulum is referring to the endoplasmic reticulum of muscle cells. Now, endoplasmic reticulum comes in two flavors in your average cell. What are they? What are the two types of endoplasmic reticulum that we find in your average cell? Sorry? Yeah, rough and smooth. What makes rough endoplasmic rough? Yeah, it's covered with ribosomes. And then smooth endoplasmic reticulum just doesn't have ribosomes on it. Based on the picture here, which version do you think the sarcoplasmic reticulum is? Smooth, right. Does anybody know what smooth endoplasmic reticulum does inside a cell? This is one of those organelles that people don't usually pay much attention to. Nobody wants to take a shot? Um, isn't it like um, have something to do with the calcium ions? Or am I thinking something different? No, you're, you're on target there. I remember um, it being a question. Okay, yeah. So in the muscle cell, sarcoplasmic reticulum stores calcium ions. For cells in general, it is a storage compartment. So some cells store other things in their smooth endoplasmic reticulum. But um, for muscle cells, it's storing calcium ions. Um, and those calcium ions are needed within the myofibril at a specific time. So the storage is wrapped around the myofibril so that it's ready to be released right when it's needed. Okay. Now the myofibril is really just a thick protein bundle. It's made up of a, a bunch of different kinds of uh, protein fibers. Um, the main types of proteins that are found are represented by the thin filaments and the thick filaments that kind of overlap. So off to the side, they label a thin filament here, and they label a thick filament over here. The thick filament is a protein called myosin. The thin filament contains a protein called actin. Now, I said those slightly differently because it's important. The thick filament is only made up of myosin. The thick filament is mostly actin, but it has a couple of other proteins associated with it also, which isn't pointed out here. Um, does anybody know what actin does for your average cell? Yeah, there's, there's actin in every cell of your body. What does it do in other cells? No? It's part of the cytoskeleton, okay? So the cytoskeleton is made up of a few different types of proteins. Um, one of them is actin, and it's present in all cells. Um, it's not used in the muscle cell the same way it's used in other cells, but the fact that it's part of this highlights the idea that the myofibril is really just a specialization of the cytoskeleton of these cells. Okay. Now, myosin is specifically a muscle protein. That's what myo means. But it's very closely related to other proteins that are found associated with um, uh, cytoskeletons and other cells. And in fact, Aaron, I think that's what you're getting at. There are these proteins that walk along microtubules in cells. Myosin is related to them in the way that it works. Um, I've recently seen some little uh, animations of uh, these motor proteins that are dragging um, vesicles along inside of a cell. Um, actually, there's a rather famous uh, computer animation that was made, uh, and by famous, I mean famous to biology teachers, uh, that was made by Harvard about 15 years ago. Um, and so somebody's taken that sort of approach and made it into a smaller animation um, somewhere that I've seen recently. But uh, <clears throat> the point I'm making here is that the myofibril is really kind of the cytoskeleton component of the, the muscle fiber. But it's been specialized because it's also where contraction takes place. Um, <clears throat> Now, if we looked at the whole myofibril, the whole length of the muscle fiber, 
we'd actually see that it has a repeating pattern that's represented by what's underneath this um, bracket right here. So at either end of the bracket is a zigzag line called the Z-disk. Um, and attached to the Z-disk in either direction are the thin filaments. Um, so thin filaments uh, attached when the Z-disk zags point one direction and attached where it zigs point the other direction. If zig and zag are active nouns describing what the zigzag line does. But, um, so you can kind of see that the line goes back and forth and at each intersection, there's a thin filament that extends uh, <clears throat> towards the middle of what's bracketed out here. Now, what's bracketed out is called the sarcomere. Again, it uses sarco, that sort of special prefix for a root for things having to do with muscle cells. Mere is um, very similar to the mer in polymer or monomer. Um, a monomer is a single unit that makes a chain called a polymer, like amino acids making up a protein or glucose molecules making up starch or something like that. Sarcomeres are repeating patterns that make up the whole length of the, I mean, repeating units that make up the whole length of the myofibril. What happens in one sarcomere is repeated in its neighbor and its neighbor and everything kind of happens together. And we're gonna concentrate on what's happening in the sarcomere. Um, <clears throat> Now, at the bottom, there are these brackets that say I band and A band. And up in the uh, picture of the cell above, we have I band and A band pointed out here. And the I band and the A band pointed out on the cell is pointing to those striations that I show you, showed you in the microscope earlier. And the A band is specifically everywhere that we see the thick filament, the myosin. And then where we do not see the thick filament, from this point over to this point, that's the I band. Now, A and I basically correspond to the vowel that's in the word, A for dark, I for light. Um, and where there's myosin, this thick filament, it picks up a lot of stain, so it stains darker than where there is no myosin. Okay, So that's really what the striations are. Where there's myosin, it picks up stain, it's dark. Where there's not myosin, it doesn't pick up stain, it's not dark. All of the myosin of all of the um, sarcomeres are lined up together. So we see the striation going across this cell, which just highlights that all of the myofibrils are lined up perfectly so that all of their A bands correspond. We can actually see it at the whole cell level. So that is the striation. Okay. And being striated means that it has this myofibril structure in it. And that's how we're gonna we're gonna talk about how contraction takes place. And that means that striated muscle tissue, which is skeletal and cardiac muscle tissue, both work on the same principle of contraction because they both have this same stuff in them. Okay. Now um This next picture gets into uh, some of the finer structure within the myofibril. Um, and so we're talking about what the myosin and actin stuff is. Now myosin is uh, this thick protein. It's made up of two parts that are kind of wound together. And each part has an, its own individual head. And then a bunch of these are all sort of bundled together, making the thick filament. And we see the myosin head sticking off of it. Actin, however, is really kind of like a bead. And a string of those beads together makes an actin filament. Each actin subunit, each bead, has a spot on it, which is colored darker green here, where the head part of myosin can bind to actin. However, that binding site is blocked by another protein, which is called tropomyosin. And then every so often along the length of tropomyosin is another protein called troponin. Now in the book, they represent troponin as a single spot, 
but actually it's made up of three pieces, and we'll see that a little bit later on. But that's the thick and thin filament. Okay? Um, <clears throat> that's a structure of the protein uh, that we see here, and we're going to look at how all of this functions in a little bit. Now, in the book, they go in next to talking about the neuromuscular junction, which means where the nervous system communicates with the uh, muscle cell. Um, and I'm going to save that more for next week, but I do want to point it out here um, because it's kind of important to understand where this is going to come in later on. Now, the whole process of making a muscle contract involves what's called excitation-contraction coupling. Excitation means electrical signaling which is, originates out of the nervous system and spreads into the, nerve, uh, to the muscle fibers. And then contraction is the process that I'm going to describe next. You can't make your muscles contract without sending an electrical signal from the nervous system to it. So what this is sort of talking about is the integration between our nervous system and our musculature so that we can control skeletal muscles. Um, and again, I'm going to talk about this stuff more next week. Um, that's the end of this section. The next section goes into talking about contraction uh, and relaxation, which is just the absence of contraction. So they talk a little bit about how the nerve endings communicate with the fiber directly, and the excitation leads to contraction. Okay. That's kind of what this is setting up. And I just want to concentrate on what's happening in contraction. There. Okay. Um, the way that we usually describe what's happening here is described as the sliding filament model of contraction. The thin and thick filaments overlap in the sarcomere. And during contraction, the myosin, which I just told you uh, is related to motor proteins and other cells, is going to cause contraction by acting like a motor protein and sliding the thin filament along so that the sarcomere, which we see in its relaxed state at the top, is contracted, which we see in the bottom. Now, it's really hard to understand this at all based on static pictures like this. So it's much better to go to animations. And so on Blackboard, I have a link here that says sliding filament model animation. So I want to go here. And this is an animation that I've been using for a very long time to describe this. Um, it's on a website that's made, uh, owned by McGraw-Hill, which is a publishing company. And when I first started using it, it was associated with a different textbook. Now it's the exact same animation, but they now associate it with this particular textbook here, which is not the textbook that we use at the school and definitely not that I use in my classes here. But the animation is freely available to access online, so I want to use it to show you what's going on. If you really love this animation, then please run out and buy their book immediately. Whatever. Um, now, they've changed a few things in the animation over the years, which isn't a big deal. Um, besides this uh, now associated with a different book, they also have this little quiz here, um, which you're welcome to try out. Um, but I want this to be very clear. This is not an assignment for you to complete for this class. Okay? It's an assignment based on people that use the textbook that this copes from. Since it's freely available on the web to access, feel free to make use of it if you'd like to. I, however, am not going to require that you use it. And by that, I mean, please do not send me an email with the results of this quiz. Okay. Um, last semester, I think, is the first time that the quiz was there. And then suddenly I got all these emails from people. Don't email it to me. Okay, I don't need it. I want to play this for you, and I'm actually going to enlarge a little bit so we can see it better. Um, and there's a little voiceover uh, to it, so I'll let it run through, and then I'm gonna, after it's done its thing, I'll uh, go back and show you some things and talk a little bit more specifically about what it said. But up to hit the play button. And In a relaxed muscle, actin and myosin myofilaments lie side by side, and the H zones and I band are at maximum width. During contraction, the actin and myosin myofilaments interact. The actins are pulled toward the center of each myosin myofilament. 
As a result, the sarcomere is shortened. In the fully contracted muscle, the ends of the actin myofilaments overlap, the H zones disappear, and the I band becomes very narrow. Now, like I said earlier, over the years they've changed this a little bit. One thing that they changed back here. Actin myofilaments overlap. The H. Right there, it said the actin myofilaments overlap. What used to happen when he said that is a little circle appeared at the point where the actin filaments come together in the middle and overlap. For whatever reason, they took that out. But it says, still says in the uh, voiceover, and it is in fact true. And I'm going to show you something else in a little while, and you'll see the same thing. Okay. Um, and then he says, the H zone disappears, the I band narrows, both of which are true. The H zone is where there's myosin, but no thin filament. And so when the thin filaments slide towards the middle, the H zone disappears, because now everywhere there's thick filament, there's thin filament. Um, and then the I band narrows because the thick filament doesn't change. It's still the same size it was at the beginning. It's just draw dragged the thin filaments across it, pulling the Z band or Z disc, whatever it's called, um, towards the middle. And so the I band, where there's thin filament but not thick filament, gets very, very narrow. And then it ends pointing out here the A band remains unchanged, although the voiceover doesn't say that. That's the way it's always been as I've been using this. I would imagine sometime when the uh, animation was first made, the voiceover said the A band remains unchanged. They just dropped the voiceover for some reason, but left the bracket in the animation. And it's true. Myosin isn't changed by this. It just helps to sort of drag the thin filament across it. Now, this is a great animation to get you to start to understand what's going on, but it's a very oversimplified one. Um, the main issue is for the thin filament, they just show us actin. And they're talking about the actin myofilament. They are talking about troponin and tropomyosin, which are the other parts of the thin filament that I mentioned a little bit ago. Okay. So we have to move on to another source to get a better um, uh, representation of what's going on here. So I'm going to just go to um, do a Google search for fighting filament. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch specifically to the videos. And um, you'll see that there are a number of different videos that address sliding filament theory or model, however you want to put it. Um, you're welcome to watch any of those. What I actually want to move to instead is what's called the cross bridge cycle. Um, but before I go to that video, let me just jump back over to the book. Um, in the book, they talk about ATP and muscle contraction. And this is the figure that um, uh, illustrates that. Um, what's happening here are four steps of what we call the cross bridge cycle. Um, <clears throat> it's enumerated here in the picture, but I actually just want to use this video to show it to you. Now, um, before I start this video off, let me just say a few things about it. First off, you'll notice that, um, <clears throat> let me make it full screen. Uh, you'll notice it says AP Flix, muscle contraction, part three, cross bridge cycle. And it has the Pearson um, Publishers uh, logo on it. And it, in fact, says uh, copyright down there. Um, <clears throat> now, the textbook that my colleagues use is made by Pearson. And so students in other a and courses here that aren't using the free online textbook that we're using have paid for access to a website that includes this video as well as a few others. Somebody has posted a copy of this video to YouTube, and it's been there for years. Now, it is copyright infringement that it's up there, um, but there seems to be sort of a passive or tacit, I guess you would say, um, acceptance of it being up there by Pearson in that if they didn't want it there, they could easily tell Google to take it off of YouTube and it would be gone. Happens all the time. 
you know, somebody uh, <coughs> makes a video of themselves twerking or whatever, and there's some uh, something playing on the radio in the background, which is copyrighted music, that gets pulled from YouTube because they don't have permission well, to well, make well, a video of that. And music, I don't know the finer points of copyright law, but the point being that um, this would be pulled probably if Pearson wanted to pull it. Now, this says part three, which means that there are two other parts, and the two other parts are not available on YouTube. So I kind of see this as um, Pearson putting it up here so that you can see how amazing their videos are, but if you want the rest of them, you have to pay for them. Um, and so I'm going to take advantage of what I think is their business model and show you the free one and uh, not show you the other one. Now, if you have any friends that are taking AMP from any of my colleagues, they have paid for access to see these by buying that textbook. And if you would like to look at them, feel free to ask one of your friends uh, if they would let you uh, take a look at the website that goes with the textbook. Um, of course, they should not share their password with you. They should be sitting there next to you when you uh, watch the video. So, um, <clears throat> have we caught that? Okay. Uh, so let me play this one here. Now, this is kind of the one regret I have to having my classes use this free textbook because it doesn't have stuff like this available. And the people that made the textbook um, were of the opinion that there are things on YouTube that you can get to that show things pretty well. And yes, in fact, this is on YouTube. But uh, the level of stuff that's available on YouTube doesn't quite make it to what's available if you pay for the book. Um, but I don't think it's worth it to pay that much money for the book just to get access to these kinds of videos. Um, you can survive without them. But uh, this whole a and Flicks series that they've done is really pretty incredible. So let me play this for you. And then after it plays through, I'll go back and show you some things. After I've played this and I've talked about it, then we'll take a break and then we'll come back and we'll deal with uh, the lab stuff for today. The contraction of a skeletal muscle generates the force necessary to move the skeleton. A contraction is triggered by a series of molecular events known as the crossbridge cycle. In a skeletal muscle fiber, the functional unit of contraction is called the sarcomere. A sarcomere shortens when myosin heads in thick myofilaments form cross bridges with actin molecules in thin myofilaments. The formation of a cross bridge is initiated when calcium ions released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum bind to troponin. This binding causes troponin to change shape. Tropomyosin moves away from the myosin binding sites on actin, allowing the myosin head to bind actin and form a cross bridge. Also note that the myosin head must be activated before a cross bridge cycle can begin. This occurs when ATP binds to the myosin head and is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. The energy liberated from the hydrolysis of ATP activates the myosin head, forcing it into the cocked position. A cross bridge cycle may be divided into four steps. Step one, cross bridge formation. The activated myosin head binds to actin, forming a cross bridge. Inorganic phosphate is released, and the bond between myosin and actin becomes stronger. Step two, the power stroke. ADP is released, and the activated myosin head pivots, sliding the thin myofilament toward the center of the sarcomere. Step three, cross bridge detachment. When another ATP binds to the myosin head, 
the link between the myosin head and actin weakens, and the myosin head detaches. Step four, reactivation of the myosin head. ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. The energy released during hydrolysis reactivates the myosin head, returning it to the cocked position. As long as the binding sites on actin remain exposed, the crossbridge cycle will repeat. And as the cycle repeats, the thin myofilaments are pulled toward each other and the sarcomere shortens. This shortening causes the whole muscle to contract. Crossbridge cycling ends when calcium ions are actively transported back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Troponin returns to its original shape, allowing tropomyosin to fly over and cover the myosin binding site on actin. And that's the end of it there. So I want to point out a few things here. First off, back here. I really like right here where, oops, jumped past it. Skeletal muscle fiber, the functional unit of contraction is called. So right here where they're showing all of these sarcomeres contracting. This is one, two, three, four, five different myofibrils that we can see here. And all of the sarcomeres are doing the exact same thing. And that, it's really nice the way that they, they present that right here. The sarcomere. Um, and then just after that, it, go, it zooms in and shows a sarcomere, and it describes what's happening. And let's see. I knew I'd go too far. And it shows where the thin filament from either side actually ends up uh, overlapping in the middle there which I pointed out in that other animation, but uh, they show it here. And I, I can't remember now if the voiceover mentions that or not, but it shows you that. And then it goes into talking about where calcium binds. So calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it binds to troponin. Now, in our book, troponin is represented in that picture just by a single circle. But it actually is three separate proteins. They, as a complex, are called troponin. And they're referred to by um, subunit designations. One of them is called troponin C. Another one is called troponin something else. I can't remember, let's say N. And another one is called troponin something else. I can't remember, let's say T, OK? Um, <clears throat> I don't care what the other two are called, and I can never remember, because troponin C is important because it's what calcium actually binds to. That's where the C basically means there. I don't really care what the other two are called or how they exactly work. But when calcium binds to the C subunit, then the whole thing uh, is modified, and it causes tropomyosin, which is the green filament here, to move out of the way so that myosin can now interact with actin at the binding site. Okay. <clears throat> that has to happen to get everything started. And then once calcium's present, then myosin is going to do its thing, and we're going to go through there we go, the crossbridge cycle, which starts with crossbridge formation. And then that's when myosin attaches to actin. And then the next thing that happens is called the power stroke. Now, the term power stroke is referring to sort of a basic tenet of any motor. Um, in your car, you probably don't really know how the engine works, but you have an internal combustion engine. And what happens there is there's a cylinder that has a piston in it. And the piston slides up and down through the cylinder. What 
pushes it is a little tiny explosion of from gasoline. So gasoline is injected into the cylinder, the spark plug lights the fumes from the gasoline, and it explodes. Very, very small explosion, and it's contained within the cylinder, but that pushes the cylinder, I mean, pushes the piston through the cylinder. And that's what's called the power stroke. That's what makes your car go. If you don't have any, uh, electricity, if the uh, battery's dead or the spark plugs are shot or something like that, you can't ignite the gasoline. If you don't have gasoline, there's nothing to ignite. Those are necessary for the car to do what it's supposed to do. Okay. Um, so power stroke is just a very general motor term. And in this sense, it's talking about how the myosin head moves and pushes the thin filament along. So we just jump back and forth between these two frames here. Okay, power stroke moves things along like that. Um, and then step three is cross-bridge detachment. A new ATP molecule binds to myosin and that causes it to detach. Okay. Now step four, as this little video named it, uh, used its own term. If we go to the book in here, uh, they describe that fourth step down here that the myosin head is cocked back into position. I prefer to call it the recovery stroke, which sticks with that uh, motor thing. When the piston moves down because gas has exploded in the cylinder, that's the power stroke. When the um, piston moves back up to its original position, that's the recovery stroke. Now, a way I like to demonstrate this, which is not about an internal combustion engine, um, is about paddling the canoe. So the cross bridge cycle that we just talked about is pretty much exactly ha what happens when you paddle a canoe. Okay. You have a paddle, you put it in the water, you move it back, and that moves the canoe forward. Pull it out of the water, reach forward again, put it in the water, and you make the canoe move. Okay. That is exactly what's going on here. Okay. Cross bridge formation is when you put the paddle into the water. The power stroke is when you move the paddle back, and the canoe goes forward. Cross bridge detachment is when you take the paddle out of the water, and then the recovery stroke is when you move the paddle back forward. Okay. Now, one reason I like the uh, canoe paddle uh, representation of this is because of the recovery stroke. Now, when you put the blade of the paddle into the water, the blade is pushing against the water. It gives you a lot of force against the water, and you move the canoe forward. When you take it out of the water, obviously you're not going to be pushing against the water in the opposite direction, so the boat won't move backwards. But a good paddler actually gonna, is going to do something special with the paddle when they pull it out of the water. Okay. Anybody know what happens to the paddle in the recovery stroke? Anybody been paddling before? Yeah, you rotate it like that. Okay. So if you just keep the blade of the paddle flat against the air, then you need more energy to uh, push the paddle forward than if you rotate it and you slice through the air like that. Okay. And the reason I mention that is because when you're talking about the recovery stroke, the uh, myosin head's detached and it stays in a low position so it doesn't interfere with the thin filament um, and push it back the other way. Uh, myosin only causes the thick, thin filament to move towards the center of the um, uh, <clears throat> sarcomere. If myosin, all of the myosin heads are completely detached, um, then the thin filament will move back towards the uh, edge of the sarcomere. And the sarcomere will relax and the muscle will relax. But there's always some myosin attached there pulling it forward. Um, now, the animation I originally showed you it's a rather simplistic animation. All the myosin heads are moving in unison, kind of like a rowing crew out on the Charles River or well, the Connecticut River or something like that. But that's not really how it happens. This video makes a really good representation of um, the... Um, I didn't go too far.
F25. There we go. Um, okay, reactivate, yada, 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 go on. Um, I turned down the, uh, the voiceover so we can't hear. But uh, in a second, it's going to fly out. We're going to zoom down and see all this happening together. Now, there we go. See how all of the heads are moving independently? There's always a head attached to the thin filament at some point. With relaxation, all of the heads detach. Um, troponin and tropomycin move back into their original position, and the thin filaments have to move back out, and we relax the whole thing, which is what's happening right here. Okay. Um, so during that little part right there, let me back it up. Okay. So they're moving towards the center, and then it relaxes. Notice all of the myosin heads have stopped moving during this part, okay? Because they can't form cross bridges and get it all started up again. And it goes through and shows you what's happening there. And that's it. Okay. So, um, again, I like the video because uh, it's really well represented. It's a really well drawn representation of what's happening here. Um, for what we can tell at that scale. Nobody's ever seen that directly happening, but we have a lot of good data talking about you know, protein structure and what parts do what in there. Now, I have provided you a link to the first animation I showed you. I've not provided you a link to that second animation. Um, ethically, I don't really feel like I should, because I'm telling you not to give Pearson money and buy their textbook. So I'm not going to turn around and give you a link to get to their information. But you saw how I got there, okay? Oops. So I did a Google search for this right here and specifically looked at videos, okay? And just look down and you'll see the cross bridge cycle. But also if you do a search for sliding filament, you might find some other videos that might give you a little bit more information about what's going on. Feel free um, to look at any of those. Okay. I have not looked at these. I don't know how accurate any of them are uh, aside from this cross bridge cycle in here. but. Um, it's always a resource that you can look into. So, um, <clears throat> what I've concentrated on today is basically how the um, myofibril, the sarcomere, all that stuff contracts. Next week, when we're going to pick up with this, we're going to continue on with um, uh, sort of how that translates up to the entire muscle contracting and us being able to do work with our muscular system. Um, now, I went a little past what I would normally do.